Hey everybody, it's Joe Trippy, and welcome back to That Trippy Show with Alex Ashlow. But this week, Alex not here, so we asked our friend Trigby Olson to come back and share his perspective. We mentioned this last week, but if you're looking for blame, look elsewhere. We're focused on the future and what we learned from this cycle. We'll hit the cabinet picks too. Trigby, thanks for joining. My pleasure, Joe. It's always good to see you, even when it's dark. Hey, you know, I wanted to talk to you first, though, about you really spent a lot of time on the ground in Wisconsin in the lead up to this election. You did a lot of research and looking at things there. What do you see that explains Tammy Baldwin pulling it out, but Kamala underperforming Biden there? Give us some insight into how you think that all happened and what mattered. Yeah. So Baldwin won by almost a point. I think it was 0.8 and Harris lost by basically 0.6. The ad that people talk about a lot is the Trump campaign was running an ad about trans with Harris, Kamala on the tape. There wasn't a direct response to it. A lot of, you know, when I was out there for the last 10 days, of course, you couldn't escape the ads anywhere you went. Turn on your phone, turn on TV. They were bombing that ad in. About, I don't know, six weeks out, Hubdi shifted to that. He spent, I think, I want to say, yeah, the Republican candidate for Senate. At that point, Baldwin was leading by about five points. Um, And, you know, Tammy Baldwin, what people need to understand about Tammy Baldwin is she really, other than Tommy Thompson back in the days when he was governor, she she is a political force of that magnitude on the Democratic side, not because she seems as so much partisan, but because people just really genuinely like her. She's a really nice, she's a really nice person and and she gets out and works the state. But that ad took about five points off her and made it a dead heat race. And in fact, I was really concerned. About four days out, I happened to have the news on at the end of the day, local news, and she had a new ad up. And the ad that that Hovde was running started off with Tammy Baldwin has changed. And then it went into men transitioning to play women's sports and gender neutral pronouns and the whole mantra. Tammy Baldwin went up five days out with an ad that basically said, Eric Hovde is lying. I haven't changed. You know who I am. And she basically went straight at it. And that really, I believe at the end of the day, is what saved her. Because if you look at her margins, in the places, the rural counties where Democrats tend to underperform, but Tammy Baldwin has always performed well, there is a substantial undervote for Harris compared to where Baldwin was. And it was because she basically confronted it straight on and really kind of turned it on him. The Harris campaign never did that. And I think that really ultimately played a role in what transpired. Now, that said, Ben and the team at the Wisconsin Democrats compared to the other existential states. Turnout was not down in Wisconsin. It was down about 1.5. Ben has laid a lot of out on, out on Twitter, Ben Winkler, about what actually went down in Wisconsin. It is not a question of them not delivering what a state party does. In fact, they outplayed, I think, the Republican state party. But it was a fact that at a statewide level and at a national level, Republicans built a narrative about Harris that called into question with these voters. The Bannon line held with Republicans. The Bannon line didn't hold with these more sort of conservatives who went for Baldwin. And they, are, they really are the Trump Baldwin voters that delivered the state. That also happened in Michigan, Arizona, Nevada. And you think it's the same reason? Did they take it head on or, you know what I'm saying, or is it more also that- they- Yeah. So Slotkin, I can speak more to Slotkin. They never really went there with Slotkin. They went a different place. I forget what the issue was. But Slotkin, again, responded directly to it. And I think Gallego did as well. They did try and make that play with Kerry Lake. The reality is, I think, and I say this as a former Republican, so that, and I know you have a lot of Democrats who listen. This is my take. And you and I've talked about this a lot. Republicans build narratives. They find one or two things, even things that aren't really a thing like wars on Christmas. And they build narratives around them to communicate in these places that are sort of organically slightly right of center, a narrative. And 
it started to bleed into, for example, I think with Hispanics, right? This narrative about Democrats and liberals. And meanwhile, if you look at the campaign, quite frankly, that I think the the Biden administration ran and then Harris inherited, you know, it was all about we're going to throw this policy at these people, student loan forgiveness, and that will help us in Dane County and with students, right? If you're the Latino construction worker or you're the guy in Trempeleau County in rural Wisconsin who needs his pickup truck that he's got a loan on to get to his job, right? And he didn't go to college. He doesn't have college loan debt. He's sitting there looking at that and Republicans are building a narrative saying, hey, where's your relief? You're now basically paying- Yeah, they're giving everybody else that you help on their loans. But also, do you think to some extent, you kind of pointed out that Tammy Baldwin, you know, was a known entity. You always knew who I was. I always told you who I am. And you know it. Part of the explanation I'm wondering is she could make that case and people would look at her, you know, she looked dead in the camera and go, okay, yeah, I do know you. But a lot of them felt that they did not know Kamala Harris yet, but also they didn't, you know, go directly at it, which I think is a big lesson. I mean, you know, we should have learned this lesson, and I've said this many, many times, we should have learned this lesson about the narrative and how sort of the insidious nature of the slow drip into the body politic that they're so good at when the the whole, you know, Obama was born in Kenya thing. Everybody rolled their eyes and went like, no one in the world's going to believe that. And no one addressed it. We just let it all sit there and they kept doing it. Two years into it, Something like uh, some massive amount of American people believe that maybe Barack Obama wasn't born in America, you know, wasn't legit to the point where the White House got to release his birth certificate and say, no, no, he, he really he really is an American. He was born here. And then, of course, they say they, the next thing they start dripping into the, the narrative is it's a forgery. It's a cook. It, it's a it's a fake birth certificate. And what I'm saying is. We didn't learn that lesson, I think we should have. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the Democratic operatives out there, that you cannot leave these things. There has to be a counter narrative or you have to take it on directly. You cannot. If we had counter narratively immediately on the birth certificate thing, I mean, it's got to be immediate and direct and like, and they punch, you punch back harder on these narratives. And too often we just let them, we just let it fester and sort of shrug it off. It doesn't really matter. And I think a lot of the super PACs on the Harris side of things just kept thinking that the trans thing wasn't having any impact. So I wanted to talk to you because, you know, to be about the Lincoln Democracy Institute research, because you were running panels right up until the election. Did you see this? And what did you learn from those panels? And and what did you see happening? People who are voting early were voting for Harris. That's just a reality. And there's other data that that puts that out. Election day was always looking kind of 50-50. But a lot of late deciders went to Trump. People who were deciding, you know, who came back in our panel and said they were deciding on election day were going for Trump. And I think that is a function of economics to a degree. I think it's even more a function of a narrative being built, you know, because the economy actually, quite frankly, isn't bad. Inflation is bad. Now, I will say this, I was listening, I have been getting off of, and I, this is funny because I'm on a podcast, people should listen to your podcast, and I, of course, would listen to it, but I've been mostly pivoting to audiobooks <laughs> since election day, Joe. You know, I was listening to one last night, and the guy was making, it was about economics, and the person made the point that if you were born in the 70s, you came of age in the 70s, you lived in a time of a lot of inflation. If you were born in 1990 or coming of age, you know, you were 13, 14, 15 in 1990, you lived in a period with no inflation for a long time. And now we have inflation. And, and it would, the book is all about how experiences at formative years in economics impact how you invest, how you spend sort of your economic worldview. And I think one of the things that probably there is a failure to recognize is that you had a lot of voters who 
had never really experienced inflation. And that was shaping their uncertainty. And looking at the panels with hindsight, and as you know, the panels are really extensive in terms of our understanding of the pieces of these people. We understand their personality types and how much risk tolerance they have and all kinds of things like that. I don't know that that was accounted for enough in the understanding of what the, the election was going to look like as it pertains to younger voters. I mean, in Wisconsin and in the other existential states, Trump ran really well with 18 to 29 year old men. And when you talk to them, the reason it wasn't that they liked Donald Trump all that much, it was the economy. They were like the policies because they felt like the economy was better. Well, what is it that shaped that at its most foundational level? They had never experienced inflation and they're experiencing inflation. And that's very disconcerting to them. One, did you see any kind of realignment or problem going on with Latinos? Obviously, you just laid out young male voters. Were you seeing something similar? Or did you have enough of a panel that would give you some insight as to what was going on there? And are these, you know, with both of them, it seems that those are problems that we need to fix or, or figure out. So I'm going to be honest with you. As it relates to Latinos, the gold standard for me in terms of understanding it is Mike Madrid. And I have been intending to talk to Mike about it before I really dig into what we have in our panels. And, you know, I've kind of been playing phone tag. And I do just on broader glance and thinking about the panels that we do with LDI as it relates to that. You know, Latinos, first of all, are not, you know, singular. Like there's this assumption, okay, well, they just came here. But a lot of Latinos have been here for a couple of generations. Like I'm a Norwegian American, third generation, right? Like to sit there and say, you know, judge my politics that it's Scandinavian American. There's some truth in that and what I take from my parents and grandparents, but I don't view my policies as a Norwegian American, you know? And I think for a lot of Latinos, that's true. They also tend to be slightly more culturally conservative. And that's where I get into, you've had these narratives being built for an extended period of time. And there's also a lot of Latinos who are non-college educated workers. And for them, there was a lot of noise about policies that, that they were sitting there thinking to themselves, I'm sure. And we did see some of this in the data. Well, why are we doing that? That's a waste. It's not helping me. Like, why am I underwriting somebody who has a college degree that they can't? Not I, I need my truck, and now I'm paying twice as much for gas to get to work. Like, that's a fair critique. Yeah. And on top of it, though, the other side of this, and I, you know, you and I've talked about it a lot, is that built these networks, these information networks, disinformation networks, whatever you, you propaganda networks that feed these narratives and feast off these narratives. You know, most people focus on Fox News. It's Elon Musk on X. It's Breitbart. And forget the cryptocurrency networks that they were playing to, particularly with young men, gaming channels. They've produced these networks that they, you know, going to Sinclair Broadcasting that has anchors and journalists, uh, you know, reporters, excuse me, going on, you know, every night on the local news as an ABC affiliate or an NBC affiliate, depending on the market, and spouting off the economy's horrible and Biden's, you know, it's Biden's inflation, all that stuff. And there is no real counter. I'll always put a plug in for Says Us later on in the show. But I mean, there, there's no counter to their ownership of these networks because yeah I think for too long everybody thought well no the mainstream media will stop will fight this stuff not going to happen I mean if there's any proof that that's not ever going to happen it's this election how that covered it but I mean was, what I'm saying is it's both where these like you said these young voters or these you know who are who've never experienced inflation and at the same time they're in these networks that are being fed fear what Biden's doing to you on inflation, you know, basically stoking the fire and whether it's the hordes are going to come, you know, into your suburbs and attack you or, you know, whatever the fear narrative is, it's overwhelming the size of those networks and the power that they had. Yeah, a hundred percent. And they create closed information loops. You know, I remember having a conversation with um, somebody back during the Tea Party period, and it was after Trump became the nominee in 16, and they were saying, you know, he did it with all of these 
false grievances and fake news. And a person made a really insightful point to me. And they're like, all of us were at Lincoln Day dinners where somebody would get going with us with something we knew was false. And rather than correcting it, you know, they'd want to be talking to you because they knew you worked in politics. And instead of correcting it, you'd just be like, oh, it isn't worth having the argument. I'll just nod along. What was missed is they assumed that that was agreement, that you felt that way too. And what we're really looking at with the predicament that we're in is both biblical, I think, in some ways, but it's it really is a failure of elites, the election result, over a long extended period of time. And I don't just mean political elites, the operative class, the lobbying class, the elected class. It's a failure, quite frankly. And if we do descend into the darkness of autocracy and, you know, there's some crazy appointments and the rest coming, this is really a failure of our elites to take the necessary actions to stamp this out. And now we have a bigger problem. And so to that degree, the more focus that there is on the Democratic side about the game they know, the elections and what happened, the less focus that there is about the real game that that we're in. And that is the one where there is a real battle that is going to occur over the next four years between autocracy and democracy. And the elites are going to have to, they're going to make a choice because quite frankly, you know, voters, voters voted this way, but it's the elites that created the conditions where this could happen. And you know, everybody can sit there and look ahead. What does this mean for 2026 or 2028? We have bigger problems in the immediate, and it's going to be small battles that are won or lost on a daily basis that will determine the outcome of whether 2026 or 2028 even matter. The hubris of the Democratic consulting class, you know, on the campaign side, it's the- And the Republican yeah, too. Yeah. I mean that across the board. I'm, I agree with you. But it's happening now at the granular level. Look at all these people, right? And they're fleeing X. And where do they want to go? They want to go to Blue Sky or Threads, owned by Zuckerberg. Blue Sky, founded by Jack Dorsey, who started, who founded Twitter and built it on the same algorithm that, that X was built on. And he said that was a huge mistake. It's going to have the same problems. No. Going to the, that's what I'm saying. Everything is still this normalcy thing. No, we need to create a pro-democracy social network that builds, the, the elites aren't going to save us, right? I mean, they're going to start thinking about 2028 and, and elbowing each other. This is about building a place where a hub, our own communications hub, that is a pro-democracy social network. I mean, in other words, this is also just one piece of the pie. It's only, this doesn't solve everything, but we got to start doing these things. We got to start investing in our networks to get our message out and not be throttled by Elon Musk or deplatformed by him or Zuckerberg or, or wherever we're at, because that's the fight. The fight is, you know, can you get to 10 million people on that network? 20 million? But that's a powerful number of people, maybe 100. You know, it, what I'm saying is, but we have to start investing in doing that. And there's a lot of people who are. You know, a lot of groups out there who are trying to sort of ad hoc create these things because none of the no, nobody with the real money ever decided to invest in doing it. So that's all I'm saying. So, you know, I'll put my plug in for says us sez.us if you want to help build a pro democracy social network instead of flooding into one of the ones where the algorithm that drives anger and hate speech and all that stuff. We can build something and we got to start building it. And we are. So if you get a chance, join us there. But Trigby, I want to get to I want to get to the the transition. And it's not something that I was really looking forward to talking about. But this is some of the I mean, we totally you and I would totally have predicted and expected this. But I'm not sure even we would have expected Matt Gates as AG as the nominee AG. We first thought, okay, Marco Rubio, oh God, in a world of really bad stuff, that's not horrible. And so maybe there was like, hey, but then immediately, man, it was, it's become like, so what's your take on what this means and, and how do you see this playing out? I mean, one of the things that you and I have shared, you know, since we got to know each other is that we've done a lot of work around the world with people fighting autocracy. 
Sometimes we were even working on the same projects and didn't know it, which is pretty cool to find out. The reality is, rather than talk about the personalities, because that's sort of like getting into the policies rather than the narrative. You know, I think those who are opposed to what's happening and these appointments are crazy. And if the story is true about how the gate selection came about, like that's totally nuts that he was on the Trump plane and Susie Wiles went out to somewhere else and, and Boris Epstein and Gates convinced Trump to announce it. Like that's crazy, right? Like that's just... Yeah, Susie Wiles. And it Wiles tells you what her... Susie's job's going to be like for the next. She won't ever be able to leave the White House. I, but um, this she is. She won't be able to leave the room. No, Forget literally go to the bathroom. She, she literally left the room. Yeah, literally left up, the room and, and, and this happened. You know, this is the kind of thing that there needs to be a narrative built around it that this is crazy. And, and that should probably be the narrative. This is crazy. And then the details get into the the individual pieces. And what I mean by that is Gates, Gabbards, and why. But it's it's got to be a singular narrative that Democrats and pro-democracy people are building that and and explaining to people why, not taking the shiny object, which is to get distracted by, well, Gates is bad because of this and Tulsi's bad because of this. And that's a loser because people will get lost. It's got to be a singular narrative. We've in the game we're in, it's all about building narratives. And what about Pete Hegseth uh, as sec dev? I don't, I know less about him. I was like, who? I've been on the set with him on, years ago, but he was a hard right cheerleader. You know, I mean, it was how I always saw him. This is like, now he's going to be the secretary of defense. I mean, it's just, it's another one of the crazy ones, I think. Right. But again, again, it. I think Rather than getting into the details of them, you know, because I've seen some people talk about him, Amy Klobuchar, he's from Minnesota, and she's like, well, I've known him for a while. And, you know, he is certainly his service to the country is admirable and what he's done for vets is good. But is he up to leading an organization of 2.7 million people when his claim to fame is Donald Trump has seen him regularly on Fox? No, you know, like that's a problem. He's not Chuck Hagel. He's not James Mattis, he's not Dick Cheney, right? Like he's not any of these people to have the kind of background to run an organization like that. But again, to get into the weeds of him is is to play the game they want, to say, this is crazy and here's the potential repercussions and build the narrative. That's the key. I think the other key in this is, you know, there's lots of clearly is the story about how the Gates confirmation came up. There's lots of competing constituencies around Trump. You have the kleptocrats like Elon and, and Don Jr. and those people. You have the status quoers like Susie and Marco and those people. You have the sort of radical, radicalized culture warriors like Bannon and Boris and Gates and those people. You have this sort of insurrection, not insurrectionist, kind of just shit tossers like the Fox Newses and all of that. Those are all competing constituencies. And part of this is going to be as those constituencies have fights with each other, the people on the pro-democracy side need to understand that if somebody is your ally in the moment in these kinds of fights, even if, you know, if Dick Cheney is your ally in the moment, good. If Mitch McConnell is your ally, yesterday, Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump lost on something and we should all be happy about that, right? John Thune winning means that there's elements, at least with hope that within the Republican Senate caucus, they're not going to give up their powers of advice and consent unilaterally. You know, to Tim Snyder's point, don't give up power until you have to. OK, good. That was a win. And yesterday, Mitch McConnell was the ally of the pro-democracy space, like the anti-authoritarian space, not even pro-democracy, the anti-authoritarian, uh, uh, the Constitution and the, the, tr the guardrails. And so what we have to figure out is how do we reinforce these guardrails? And this is going to require, kind of to my point, these elites. And when I say elites, political elites, certainly, but the elites in academia, elites in media, elites in business, it's going to require them to have the spine to be reinforcing the guardrails that our founders put forth to protect our constitution. And I think part of what's got people down is Four years seems like a long fucking time, Joe. A lot of this is testing, right? I mean, he's te with the Gates nomination, it's testing. How much control do I have? Who are the weak links over in the Senate that I need to purge, that we need to primary in two years if we have to, to get them the hell out of there so I can keep clearing the party of 
of the people that want to stop me from doing what I want to do. And if you're so you're sitting there now saying, am I going to vote against Gates or not? I think I am, but I'm up in two years. And the president's on the line telling me that if I don't do it, he's going to be there. They'll find somebody to run against me. All that kind of how you keep eroding, how he's just continues to come at them and erode it. And this is, I think, all three of these uh, nominations are sort of like, how do I, where do we identify the weak links in the House and the Senate? Where do we, who's going to have the guts to stand up to me? And when they do, we're going to punish them. You know, and so th- this is how you got the party that he already owns, how you get even more of it, and you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The elites start to, to fall. Here's one idea I had. I wanted to run it by you. I've been thinking about sort of the European model probably more clear to Americans, maybe through if they've watched uh, UK politics at all. But the more I see these appointments, I'm wondering whether there should be either a democratic or pro-democracy, whatever you want to call it, shadow cabinet. In other words, if you think, if you think about like Alberto Gonzalez and Doug Jones as co- shadow attorney general in a shadow cabinet, Leon Panetta and Liz Cheney as shadow defense secretary. I mean, I'm making these things up, but where you try to, and what we we do is, yeah, every day one of them steps out and does something that's crazy or, you know, radical. Hey, call balls and strikes. If they're right, go out and say, you know, that this is good policy. We agree with it. But every, that's not going to happen very often. But on the other hand, to go out there and call out Gates, if he is the attorney general, on something he's done or some, you know, pardons that he's made, you know, whatever, some investigations that he's closed down, you have like, and I don't know, maybe it would have to be one party, but I, I, because I don't know if you could ever get, as you know, it's been tough to get, there's been Liz Cheney, there was Adam Kinzinger, there are a lot of them, but it might be tough to get even former Republicans to to participate in that. But I, I'm, I think it might be a way to constantly be a counter in the narrative, to counter their narrative, hold press conferences, put out statements, actually be amplified by a, a pro-democracy network out there, you know, social network, and, you know, create the kind of, of information hub to counter what they're doing, but use a shadow cabinet to attack, to always keep the pressure on. I, I don't know if you think that. I mean, I know, again, because you've been out there in across overseas and seen things, would something like that be something you think worth trying to get off the ground? Yeah, I think having people that are dedicated with cross the positions that the cabinet has to counter the narratives is important and the credibility to do that. A bipartisan sort of effort probably is of more use than a partisan one. Because what we have to think about in these things, you know, so they're trying to assemble assemble a vertical power structure underneath Donald Trump. They did it with the Republican Party. Now they're going to try and pull in that they control government, the, the apparatuses of government for control. You know, I wrote seven rules long ago for people overseas on seven rules for, for confronting autocrats and their enablers. It's out on my Twitter feed. It's on my Says Us feed, I think. But here's, you know, number seven is each of us every day needs to wake up and think, how do we disrupt the vertical? How do we chip at it? And strategically, regardless of where you sit, there's three things that you have to think about. Disturbing, disrupting, and diminishing. And everything from a strategic standpoint that the pro-democracy side needs to be thinking about. And that's whether you're somebody who's out publicly as part of it or you're somebody who's inside the Trump administration and you're uncomfortable with something, it's how do you disturb, disrupt, and diminish. And that is something that you know people need to be asking themselves, what can I do as an individual? And some of it's more public, some of it's more private, but that really is what it comes back to because their strategy is going to be to, to make them be perceived that vertical and Donald Trump at the center of it and the people around him inevitable, invincible, and they do it through fear. That feeling that people have in the pit of their stomach, this is really bad to get them to either fight, which they don't want, uh, flight or freeze. And freeze and, and flight are our enemies. 
right? We need people to stand up and fight the fear because, and that requires hope. One of the things that makes me hopeful is sort of the answer to this question from Brian in California that Alex wanted, wanted to ask the two of us. With Republicans controlling the trifecta, is it better that they can implement policy that we can hold them accountable for, or do Democrats need to try to obstruct? And my answer to this, Trigby, is I'm actually, as a Democrat, happy that we narrowly lost the House instead of narrowly winning it, because in a lot of ways exposes the problems within the Republican Party. In other words, Donald Trump, anything that he that he truly promised, but let's say, let's argue mass deportations, but could claim that the Democratic House was holding him up. It's That's what's responsible for me not being able to accomplish this or not getting the wall built. It's the Democrats in the House. He'd have the enemy from within to blame for anything that went bad or that he claimed stood in his way. Now, when he does mass deportations, and I, I think they'll try to do that, there's a, a problem. If he doesn't do them, he's got no one to blame. There will be plenty of people in his MAGA base that will be upset that he's not doing it. If he does do it, there's a lot of people, a lot of Latinos and others, who will be so appalled that he'll lose that part of it. I mean, so I just think this is an interesting thing. I know that people are upset that we, you know, that it was a trifecta, but I actually think it might it might create the kind of schisms we need within the, his structure weaken it, you know, in the first two years. Or are you less hopeful about that? So I look at it this way, setting aside 2026, right? Because that's the game we know. That's not the game we're in. In the game we're in, it actually is a good thing the way it turned out. They have a three-seat majority in the Senate. But there are institutionalists in the Senate. There are you know, you look at the response to the Gates nomination. That nomination and probably Tulsi are going to fail. He might throw up somebody worse. Event. Ed, ed, the question becomes how many times do they beat them down? But you're going to have people in the Senate, either out of loyalty to the institution or the loyalty out of crazy, who are likely to stand up to it. And remember, he lost yesterday when behind closed doors, with him not being able to know, there was a vote. Okay. Mitch McConnell's failed after January 6th, no doubt, because they believe they could have the coalition without the insanity. But you know, one of the rules of dealing with autocrats is you take anybody who comes over at any point to the side. And so yesterday he was on the side. We would hope that given, I, I can say this having worked for him, Mitch McConnell loves the United States Senate. Is he going to hand over the United States Senate to Donald Trump? I don't know. Maybe. But he's not running again. You got Murkowski. You've got, there are a bunch of them. Democrats need to stand strong, but they need to build a singular narrative. This is crazy. This is, and they need to make it a real choice for the American people and not worry about the election in 2026. And there's a difference between policies and stuff that's not constitutional. They have to go to the wall when it's about the Constitution. They may lose some things, but that's okay. I think the other thing is, you know, look at the House. He's now got three people. Gates resigned. I, that seat's probably safe, but like they only had 220. Now they're down to 217. I just think you have to look at where these pieces fall. I don't know exactly where in sort of the schematic Mike Johnson falls. Is he a cultural sort of deconstructor or is he more a status quo guy? I think the Senate is filled with status quo people. The political operative class is filled with status quo people. They just want to make their money and mass deportation is not good for the status quo. It'll be a disaster for the economy too. We've got to recognize, I'll tell you this, the other thing. So I want to bounce this off of you. I've been thinking about this. So one of the points of pushback constitutionally and otherwise, politically and in the game we're in, is governors, okay? You know, and 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 if they're going to send, I, I don't, Pritzker or whatever his name is from Illinois said, I'm not having the Alabama National Guard show up and take immigrants out of Illinois. So yeah, here's the argument Democrats need to be making. They need to, rather than talking about the details and getting lost in that, and I think he made a good point with that, 
they need to make it about states' rights. Republicans and conservatives have been hearing about states' rights and we have to have states' rights forever. All these Democrat governors have to stand up and say, hey, this is about states' rights. State of Michigan isn't going to, they need to turn the tables on this shit. That and the rule of dealing with autocrats is what I call zero sum judo. Take their strengths and turn them against them, just like you do in judo. Every single one of those governors should be standing up and saying, this is an issue of states' rights. And from California to Wisconsin to Pennsylvania to wherever, our states have just as much right as Alabama and keep your people out of our state. And that will turn with those, it creates a cognitive dissonance with those Republicans who've been like, well, yeah, we're, we're, the state should be deciding. It's this kind of thinking that I've enjoyed uh, working with you over the last couple of years because it kind of like raises something I, I would never have thought of as, a, as an argument, but I think you're right. That needs to be the argument. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, that's why we have you on the show. Uh, but hey, uh, thanks, Trigvy, for being with us. We're running out of time here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to that trippy show. Says dot us is now live. Sign up and free yourself of Elon doom scrolling at sez dot us. And, and seriously, there are all kinds of places to be where you can be on social network. I decided to start this thing because I thought it was time that we had an unabashedly pro democracy social network made up of people, different communities, different ideas but that are decidedly pro-democracy, that put the party, I forget that, and you know, put their country first and can just have civil conversation and discussion and debate without the bots and all the anonymous attacks that happen on, uh, that are amplified on the other network. So I really hope if you, we talked about things that people can do, well, you can help build a pro-democracy social network at sez.us. This podcast will always be free and is part of Resolute Square, so check out the latest at ResoluteSquare.com slash trippy. Please subscribe to that trippy show and leave a review on Apple or wherever you listen. And if you're listening to this episode on YouTube, please like and subscribe to get alerts when we post the next episode. You can always send us a question, like Ryan did, at thattrippyshow at gmail.com or leave us a question and a review on iTunes. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Trigby. Resolute Square.